What's going on, guys? Welcome back to The Control Room. I'm your host, Esrael Johannes. This is the first episode of the 2024 NBA playoffs. So I'm going to give you a little preview of the Mavs Clippers series as well as the Pelicans Thunder series. Now, if you are watching or listening to this episode after game one or even game two or three have already been played, no worries. These stats that I'm going to give out this episode are reflective of these team stats throughout the season. So you can always listen to it, watch it, come back, and then as we get about halfway through the series, then another episode will come out giving more of an update as to what's actually going on in the postseason. But this is more of a season recap and what to look out for throughout the entirety of the series. So feel free to come back to this episode even after um, the first or two, even two games have already gone through. Now, the top topics, the Mavs. Season recap, because we got to go back to episode one and revisit all of those topics that were talked about then. And then we'll preview how that series shakes out with the Clippers. Then the Pelicans, they were on the brink against Sacramento, but then ended up earning the eighth seed. And so they will now face number one, Oklahoma City. And speaking of OKC, they secured the top spot in the West via a tiebreaker over Denver. And we'll see how Oklahoma City matches up with the Pelicans. Thank goodness they didn't have to play the Lakers, but that's another story for another day. Now, let's get back to the Mavericks and talk about that season recap. Let's turn back the clock to episode one. There were seven categories, seven seven pieces of stats that I wanted the Mavs to improve upon after last season. They were rebounding, three-point shooting, free throw percentage, Second chance points, paint points, fast break points, and clutch game execution. And what I had said in episode one was that if they marginally fixed those seven categories, that they would be better statistically throughout the rest of the season. So let's take a look. How do they actually fare? The Mavs rebounding definitely improved. Last season, they were 25 and 39. In 64 games out-rebounded, they had led the league in games played by as many as nine. Brooklyn was the next most with 55, and it tied the second most in franchise history in terms of games played in a season where they were out-rebounded, which it only goes back to 1984-85. Now this season, the Mavs were 22 and 23 in 45 games out-rebounded, so They kept the wins pretty close. They didn't have as many losses, and they brought down the amount of times they were out-rebounded. It ties the seventh most games played in the NBA this season, as well as the second most wins. It was the second most in wins, and the fourth best win percentage in the NBA at 48.9%. That is the 11th best win percentage in franchise history. And then if we look at how they play whenever they match or out-rebound opponents, because why not? They spent almost half the season doing that. They're 28-9, and which is the 11th best win percentage in the NBA in that side of the coin. That's 75.7%. And last season, they were 13-5, and which was 72.2%. So for the Mavericks, normally, and really for any team, when you out-rebound your opponents, at least match them, but definitely out-rebound them, you tend to have more success, and it's reflective in the numbers strictly in wins, no matter what. That is non-negotiable. So they did better this season in that category. Let's move on to three-point shooting. The Mavs' three-pointers this season was at 36.9%, which is 13th in the NBA. Last season, they were slightly higher in percentage at 37.1%. Now, here's the difference. I'm going I'm to break down four different subsections in this category, and they are all reflective of before and after the trade deadline. And really when the first game that P.J. Washington and Daniel Gafford participated for the Mavericks. So that date was February 10th at home versus OKC. The Mavs were shooting 37.4% before February 10th, but after they were shooting 36%. A little bit of a drop off. It seemed to be the whole team. It, it, it was like the Mavs were playing better from three beforehand. 
I wouldn't say that the additions to the team brought down their three-point shooting. It just so happened that everyone wasn't making as many threes after the fact. How they kept winning, though, I'm about to get to. Let's look at their three-point attempts, because this is really important when it comes to their three-point rate, which I'm going to mention right after this. They had 39.5 three-point field goal attempts per game, which was the second most in the NBA. However, last season, that number was 41. When you break it down before and after the trade deadline, the Mavs attempted 40.6 three-point attempts before February 10th, but since 37.6. That's three attempts less per game, which may not seem like a lot, but for some games where you're not shooting the three as often, there were times when the Mavs didn't even shoot 30. The play style affected how many times the Mavs chucked up a three now let's look at the three-point rate which is the percentage of field goal attempts that came from three it was at 44.1 percent which was the second highest in the nba this season but you compare that to last year they shot with a three-point rate of 48.7 percent that was stupidly high before the trade deadline their three-point rate was 45.4 percent Since then, it dropped to 41.9%, and I think that's the most significant, that the Mavs, although their three-point percentage suggested that they could still live a little by the three, they chose not to, which is what I wanted all of last year. Now, if you look at their two-point field goal percentage, why does that matter with threes? Again, it's that if you convert a lot of your two-point shooting compared to your three-point shooting, the 60-40 split that I've mentioned in the past, then you can justify going for two more often than you go for three, and thus your three-point rate will drop, which we I just mentioned. The two-point field goal percentage for the Mavericks throughout the season was 56.9%, and that was fourth best in the NBA. Last year, it was actually half a percentage point higher, which was 57.4%. Before the trade deadline, though, the Mavs were only shooting 56%. And since then, 58.3%. And a lot of that has to do with, one, how efficient Derek Lively has been all season at the rim. But two, how efficient Daniel Gafford has been at the rim. And it's been reflective in the streaks that he's had of consecutive field goals made where he nearly, nearly broke the record that Wilt Chamberlain has held for ever. He still has, Daniel Gafford does, the second longest streak of consecutive field goals made at 33, two shots behind Wilt Chamberlain's 35. And he also happened to have two of the three longest streaks in the play-by-play era because he's just that efficient, And but that also is a testament to how Luka Doncic plays because the, these streaks tend to happen when Luka Doncic is on the floor. The moment he's not, the streaks go away. All right, now that we've taken care of the three-point shooting and how well the Mavs play on the inside, let's look at their free throw shooting because last year they were god-awful. This year they shot 75.8% from the free throw line, which was 27th in the NBA. Last season was about 75.5%. Not that much of an improvement, but an improvement nonetheless. I would still like to see more because the average has jumped and players are better at shooting from the free throw line. Now, when we take a look at the free throw attempts, how often the Mavs draw a foul and get to the to the stripe, the Mavs attempt 22 and a half free throw attempts per game, which is 11th most in the NBA. Last season, it was 25.1. So they did it more often back then, surprisingly, despite the amount of threes they took. That, again, has to do with Luka Doncic and how often he drives and collapses defenses. Luka himself accounts for 8.7 free throw attempts per game, which is the second most for a player in the NBA. And according to StatMuse, he actually leads the league in scoring when you take away free throws. So even if he didn't have that in his game, he'd still be effective on the floor, but because he adds that to his game, he's even more ridiculous. Where the Mavs are different, where the free throw shooting is different this season than it has been in the past, is their free throw percentage in the clutch. And for a majority of the season, they were hovering at least at 90%. They finished the year at 85.5% in the clutch 
from the free throw line, which was third in the NBA this season. That is actually the best clutch free throw percentage in franchise history, at least for a season. Since 96-97, that's the play-by-play era, that's when we could track clutch time. So although for, for the entirety of the game, over the course of the season, the Mavs barely improved on their free throw shooting, when it counts, when it matters the most, the Mavs are locked in, and they're led by Kyrie, who is one of the more efficient scorers in the fourth quarter. He, we call him the king of the fourth quarter for a reason. Led by him, and the fact that Luka doesn't miss as often in clutch time compared to the rest of the game, the rest of the team seems to be contagious with that. No one's missing as many free throws at that point in the game, which is good to see because it's it, it's very important down the stretch, especially in the postseason. Now, the miscellaneous categories. We're, we're going to start with the second chance points. The Mavs averaged 13.4 second chance points per game this season, which was 20th in the NBA. As a whole, you're thinking they weren't even in the top half. That's kind of not the point. Here's why. Last season, they averaged 10.9 second chance points per game, which was 29th in the NBA. So really, it was just a matter of being better than yourself from last year. And their, the, the depth at the big man position, power forward and center, the ability to rebound defensively and offensively, in, in this case, mainly offensively. That has led to more second chance points, which has led to just a couple more points per game for the Mavericks, which always helps your scoring overall. Reflective of those offensive rebounds, this year they had 9.7 offensive rebounds per game this year. That's 23rd in the NBA compared to last season at 7.6, which was last in the NBA. So a, a two offensive rebound per game jump 2.1 offensive rebound per game jump reflecting in all of these stats and then if you look at the field goal percentage overall this season the Mavs shoot 48.1 percent which is 11th in the NBA the reason that I put that number there is because in order to get offensive rebounds you would have to miss shots so how efficient that team is at shooting the ball also reflects how you're going to get second chance points. The same situation applies to Oklahoma City, which will be in the next segment. But in this case, I wanted to give that stat so that it paints the whole picture as to why the Mavs have the numbers that they do. The next category is points in the paint. This, again, reflective of the depth at the big man position. 47.4 47.4 paint points per game this season, which was 24th in the NBA. Surprisingly, it's the most paint points in a game in a season in franchise history in the play-by-play era. So although it's not a lot in, in comparison to the rest of the league, it's a lot for the Mavericks. Be, especially when you consider the fact that Dirk Nowitzki was your most talented big man, but he played from outside first. Sometimes he played in the post, obviously, but because it was him and maybe Tyson Chandler or so on and so forth, You didn't have as many points in the paint because of all that outside shooting. Now, here's where the kicker comes into play, right? Since February 10th, the Mavs score 50.8 paint points per game, which is 10th in the NBA in that span. That is where you want to be across the entirety of the season. Imagine if the Mavs had Daniel Gafford and P.J. Washington and they had the health and the depth available to them throughout the entirety of the season, the Mavs probably would have been in the top half in paint points per game. And how they've played since getting those pieces is reflecting those numbers. Now, last season, they scored only 42.8 paint points per game, which was last in the NBA as well. So they have improved. They got about four and a half more points per game in the paint overall. Imagine if that's all of last season versus since February 10th this season, that's an eight-point jump in the paint. Still reflective of how much fewer threes they're shooting, but the efficiency ratings, the the scoring is only going up for the Mavs because they're playing better from inside and they're still playing as well as they are outside. 
Moving on to the next category, the fast break points. The Mavs have 15.8 fast break points per game this season, which is eighth in the NBA. This was probably the most surprising thing considering the pace that Luka Doncic plays at. This is the sixth most fast break points per game in a season in franchise history since 96-97. And it's also the most for Dallas since 2014-2015. Again, ridiculously surprising. Considering last year, the Mavs had only 11 fast break points per game, which was 29th in the NBA. And that factors in the time that was spent with Kyrie. So let's break that apart a little bit. Before Kyrie was traded to Dallas, the Mavs had 9.9 fast break points per game, which was 30th in the NBA, and they were the only team that had fewer than 10. Since Kyrie was traded and played his first game with the Mavs, they had 13.3 fast break points per game, which was 21st in the NBA in that span, about February 8th beyond in 2023. So even, even with Kyrie, they had more fast break points per game this season. And of course, a lot has to do with how Luka conditioned himself during the offseason so that he could play at a faster pace. Even Jason Kidd has mentioned that has been one of the goals of the Mavs offensively, even before the trade deadline. They wanted to play faster so that they could get easier buckets and that would help their overall scoring so that it would be easier to win more games. Who would have thought? Did I mention it? I did in episode one. Okay. Now let's check their clutch game execution. We'd already talked about how they shot the free throws, the free throw percentage in the clutch. Let's take a look at the rest of it. The Mavs executed with a 23-9 and record in clutch games this season with a 71.9% win percentage. That was the second best win percentage this season behind the Lakers who went 24-9 and with a 72.7% win percentage. This 23-9 record ties the third best record through 32 clutch games in a season in franchise history since 96-97, and the best since the Mavericks won the title in 2010-2011. On top of that, the Mavs also won six of their last seven clutch games this season, and since they beat the Warriors in San Francisco on December 30th, 2023, in the the clutch, including that game, they are 13-4 through the rest of the season. Now let's take a look at the advanced clutch stats, why I think this team is very effective in the clutch and how well they've performed this year compared to last year and especially the very end of last year. Their efficiency offensively was 127.1. That's their offensive rating, 127.1. That's the best offensive rating in the NBA all season long. The defensive rating, was 106.7, which is the ninth best defense in the NBA in the clutch. Their net rating was 20.5. I think there are only three teams with a 20 or higher net rating in the clutch. And the Mavs are third in the NBA. On top of that, their assist-to-turnover ratio is splendid in the clutch. So that assist-to-turnover ratio is 3.41, which actually leads the league. So they have 3.41 times as many assists as they do turnovers. The Mavs already are one of the best teams at taking care of the ball, so no question that they would have a really high ratio. But the amount of assists that they generate, one, because of Luka, two, because of Kyrie, and because of the nature of that offense, the Mavs are really showing it in that ratio. On top of that, their turnover percentage, which means percentage of plays that end in a player or team turnover. That includes bad passes, 24-second violations, offensive fouls. Their percentage is 7.2%, which also leads the league. More support. When you ever want to have a debate with people about how the Mavs play in the clutch. And then just because, why not? Because everyone wants to rave about, you know, the advanced metrics that Jokic that Jokic brings to the Denver Nuggets. Let's do the same for the Mavericks. Why not, right? The player impact estimate is a 65.5 PIE or PI, which is second in the NBA behind Denver at 67.6. So although Denver is the best in those advanced metrics, 
Dallas is not that far behind them. Need I say more? Before we move on to the playoff preview, let's also keep into context how they played in the clutch last year. The Mavs finished 26-29 and 29 last season, which was the most games played in the NBA with 55. Miami was the next most with 54. They lost eight of their last nine clutch games, including seven straight throughout that stretch, and it was abysmal to have to work through. But that was one of the key pieces, one of the seven key pieces that I wanted the Mavs to improve on, and they have not only improved on it, they've excelled at it. So now let's take a look at their matchup with the Clippers. I've already gone through all the strengths that the Mavs have with these improvements across the seven categories that I wanted them to improve on at the beginning of the year. Now let's take a look at what the Clippers are really doing here. The Clippers' strengths start with their shooting splits. They shoot 48.9% from the floor, which is sixth best in the NBA, They also have the sixth best three-point shooting in the NBA, 38.1%. They also shoot 82.5% from the free throw line, which is third in the NBA. That's not in the clutch. That's across the whole game. And because they've added James Harden, who is a great free throw shooter, that only adds to the efficiency that they have. Him and Paul George and Kawhi Leonard's also a good free throw shooter. So you have plenty of options at the free throw line. Efficiency for the Clippers is also important, but this is more so on the offensive side. They have a 117.9 offensive rating, which is fourth in the NBA. Their net rating is 3.4, which is seventh in the NBA. So although their defense is not within the, within the top 10, they still have a high-powered offense that you have to stop, which is very difficult when you factor in all four of their quote-unquote superstars. Because at one point in their careers, those four guys were superstars in Kawhi Leonard, Paul George, James Harden, and Russell Westbrook. In the clutch, the Clippers shoot 87.4% from the free throw line, which is second in the NBA. That's the best among playoff teams. So of any team that the Mavs would have to go up against, of course, it's the Clippers, the only team that shoots better than them from the free throw line in the clutch. Now... Their clutch efficiency also matters because it's more than just the free throw percentage. Offensively, their offensive rating is a 121.6, which is fourth in the NBA. Their defensive rating is 107.1, which is 10th in the NBA. So their net rating is 14.6, and that ranks sixth in the NBA. It is very important to note that when it gets down to the wire, down in the nitty-gritty, like you need those last few points or you need to stop another team from generating some offense. Having both sides of the ball be one of the best in the league, or at least in the top third in the league, gives you an advantage. On top of that, defensively, why do they have such a good defensive rating? They steal the ball at an effective rate, and this is across the entire game and not just the clutch. They average 7.8 steals per game, which is 7th in the NBA. And then, if we didn't need more offensive stats, why not take a look at the best offensive lineups in the Western Conference playoffs? So across all lineups, all five-man lineups that have played at least 100 minutes together, the best, the fourth best offensive lineup is the Clippers. But not their starting lineup. Here's, Here's actually... There are five. It's James Harden, Paul George, Kawhi Leonard, Mason Plumlee, and Terrence Mann. Those five guys give you a 133.2 offensive rating, which is the fourth best in the NBA among five-man lineups that have played 100 minutes or more. So they have one of those. <laughs> they, have a good, they have a good offensive lineup. And that's... That's not the only lineup Tyron Lue is going to use. He's going to have multiple at his disposal, and he's going to exploit whatever he possibly can. Now, speaking of exploitation, there are some weaknesses with the Clippers that the Mavs can exploit. So they tend to switch on the defensive side of the ball. Normally, when you switch, you have players that can defend all positions at all times. That might not always be the case based on who is out on the floor for L.A., So the defensive switches can create some mismatches 
that the Mavs will definitely exploit, such as Luka against Ivica Zubats. Luka schools this man. It's, it's not hyperbole to say Luka has some of his best games against Zubats. So if, if the Clippers are going to switch, they have to know that that is a possibility. And they did it to Patrick Beverly for two games the last time they faced off. And then on top of that, the Mavs also, because they like to use the pick and roll to create those mismatches, those switches are going to help them do that. The Mavs have 9.8 screen assists per game, which is the fourth most in the NBA. And a screen assist, if you had seen J.J. Redick and LeBron James' podcast, Mind the Game, they had talked about what a screen assist is. It's a screen that directly leads to a made field goal, such as Daniel Gafford or Derek Lively will set a pick for Luka Doncic or Kyrie Irving. The ball handler will go over the screen and take a shot, make a shot. That's a screen assist for the post player, for the one setting the screen. So the Mavs have a lot of those. And really, they did have a high amount of screen assists per game last season. So it's it's a focal point of their offense. Speaking of the guy running their offense, the Mavs offense, Luka Doncic has 10 40-point games versus the Clippers. Why does that matter? That is the most by an, by an opponent in Clippers franchise history when you include the postseason. Again, Luka schools Zubats, but also schools the Clippers. And Kawhi has been on that team for most of Luka's career. So really, like, they got to watch out for Luka Doncic. I mean, you, you, what are you, you going to do? You're going to try to stop him? Good luck. He's got weapons. If you decide to hold the weapons, he might go off for 73 again. You never know. The Mavs starting lineup is also a weakness for the Clippers. Sounds odd when you just say it like that. But here's what I mean. The lineup of Luka Doncic, Kyrie Irving, Derek Jones Jr., P.J. Washington, and Daniel Gafford give you a 99.7 defensive rating. Yes, a Mavs lineup with a defensive rating under 100. Ooh, shocker. That's the sixth best in the NBA and fourth among playoff teams among five-man lineups that have played 100 minutes or more. And, there, and just so there's context, there are over 100 lineups that have played at least 100 minutes. So this isn't like, oh, they're the sixth best out of 20. No, this is over 100. On top of that, the Clippers have low clutch scoring. A little odd considering they have great clutch efficiency. They score only 7.9 points per game in the clutch, which is 23rd in the NBA. And so with the Mavs offense, they can overtake them easily in the clutch in that situation. And the biggest and most important factor that I cannot stress enough is the health of Kawhi Leonard. He is still questionable with knee inflammation. By the time this goes out, we may find out if he plays or not. If he plays the whole series, it could tip the balance in favor of the Clippers ever so slightly. Where I think it will go, I'm saving that for the last segment. Stick around for that. Now that we've completed the preview for the Mavericks and the Clippers, the next segment, we're going to talk about the Pelicans and the Thunder and how they match up with each other. That's coming up next. The flock has landed in Oklahoma City. The Pelicans will be playing the Thunder in OKC for game one on Sunday night, which for me, that's tonight. They reached the playoffs without Zion Williamson. If you paid attention to the play in tournament, the first game against the Lakers, that battle for the seven spot, Zion went off for 40 points and then mysteriously had to leave the game with about three and some change to go. And we found out it was a left hamstring strain, which is different than the other injuries he sustained in the past, including the previous hamstring strain. Those tend to have been on the right side of his body. This one's on the left side, so it was just one of those odd moments where the body was like, I'm not going to work for you today. 
So he's going to be out for at least two weeks, which means he's probably not playing the entirety of the first round. In previous seasons, this would have killed the Pelicans. In fact, it did hurt them last year. But this time around, the way that their offense is designed, with the help of James Borrego, that has completely transformed how the Pelicans play when he does not step on the floor. We're going to get to that in just a little bit. So let's break down real quick how they got there. They defeated the Sacramento Kings 105-98 to to earn the number 8 seed in the West. And what a matchup it was for the Pelicans because they swept the Kings 6 to nothing in the regular season, in-season tournament slash NBA Cup, and the play-in combined. That's practically never happened. So, shout out to them. It, it just happens to be, to be a matchup thing, but also the Pelicans can be effective, even without their best player. Now, when you look at their season series against the Thunder, the Thunder won over the Pelicans 2-1. to one. The Pelicans won the first game, and then the Thunder won the next two. They're not in the same division. The Thunder are in the Northwest. The, the Pelicans are in the Southwest. So, only three games this year. Let's take a look at some strengths for the Pelicans. They are road warriors, which is great for them when every series from this point on means that they have to play four games on the road out of the seven. For the Pelicans, they are 28 and 14, which is a 66.7 win percentage on the road this season. That's the best road record in the NBA, even better than Boston. Their defensive efficiency across the board is one of is within the top 20% in the NBA. They have a 111.9 defensive rating, which is 6th in the NBA, and a 4.6 net rating, which is also 6th in the NBA. Their field goal and three-point defense also matters here because they have a 46.4% opponent field goal percentage, which is 7th in the NBA, and a 34.9% opponent three-point field goal percentage, which is second in the NBA and first among playoff teams. So they are the best of the remaining 16. On top of that, I did just mention how much better the Pelicans play this season compared to seasons past when Zion is not available. Here's a direct reflection on that stat. The starting lineup for the Pelicans without Zion is C.J. McCollum, Trey Murphy III, Herbert Jones, Brandon Ingram, and Jonas Valanciunas. Again, among all five-man lineups that have played at least 100 minutes together, this lineup gives you a 96.4 defensive rating, which is second in the NBA and first in the West. Forget playoff teams. It's second in the NBA and first in the West. So they're still locked in. They're cohesive when they're together, even without Zion. Yes, it does mean that the Pelicans bench takes a little bit of a dip. The second line does not score as many points because Trey is not the one leading the charge there, but he still provides offensive firepower no matter if he's starting or if he's on the bench. He's been effective in both roles. After that, the Pelicans steal at a high rate at 8.3 steals per game, which is the third most in the NBA. They also shoot really well from the corner, which has been a topic that we have talked about on Pelicans Live all season long, especially when it's led by Herb Jones, who is having a career year shooting the three, especially from the corner. From the corner, the Pelicans shoot 42.6%, which is second in the NBA and first in the West. And then on top of that, I did just mention the bench for the Pels. They are very deep. Their depth shows a 2.9 bench net rating, which is third in the NBA. And because of that James Brego offense, they're built to stay effective on the floor, as I said, probably about four times now. They can be effective even without Zion on the floor. Again, I want to stress the importance of CJ McCollum. I had done this in a couple episodes ago. Where as a score, New Orleans is 15 and 3 this season when CJ scores 25 or more. As a passer, New Orleans is 11 and 3 when CJ has 7 or more assists. And as a shooter, when CJ shoots 45% from the floor overall, the Pels are 29 and 6 
When he shoots 40% or better from three, they are 27 and seven. So he can't regress to a seven point effort like he had in the play in. He has to be one of those guys, as well as Brandon Ingram, bringing on all of this type of offense, whether it's shooting, whether it's passing, whether it's scoring. He has to be effective and, and cannot disappear. Even if he's not scoring as well or shooting as well as he wants to, the plays that he makes in the defensive on the end of the floor are going to matter. The plays that he makes to facilitate the offense a little bit more cleanly is going to matter. So that he's going to be a focal point for the Pelicans. If the Thunder can limit CJ and the bench doesn't outscore them, which again, the Thunder are also very deep, then Brandon Ingram on his own is not going to be enough to overtake the Thunder and how well they are how well they are led by their MVP candidate in Shea Gilders Alexander. Now I've teased enough of OKC. Let's go right into it. The strengths for the Thunder. They're the number one seed in the West. They're going to have home court throughout the entirety of the Western Conference half of the bracket. They're the eighth team in NBA history to earn the number one seed in their respective conference the season after missing the playoffs. The last one who did it won the NBA championship. That was the Los Angeles Lakers after they missed the playoffs in 1819 and then went on to win in the bubble in 1920. They also have a lot of consistency. The Thunder starting five of Shea Gilgis Alexander, Josh Giddy, J-Dub Jalen Williams, Lou Dort, and Chet Holmgren have played 799 minutes together this season. That's the second most in the NBA. Scoring-wise, the Thunder score a lot of points, 120.1 points per game, which is the third most in the NBA. Their shooting splits are efficient. They are top four in each of these categories. 49.9% from the floor, third in the NBA. 38.9% from three, first in the NBA. And 82.5% from the free throw line, which is fourth in the NBA. And their efficiency is also top four. All of their efficiency categories are in the top four. They have a 118.3 offensive rating, which is the third best offense in the NBA, a 111 defensive rating, which is fourth best in the NBA, and a 7.3 net rating, which is second in the NBA. They are one of only two teams that are top five in both. The only other one is Boston. And then if you take a look at stocks, which is steals and blocks, They have eight and a half steals per game, which is tied for the most in the NBA with Philadelphia. They also have 6.6 blocks per game, which is also tied for the most in the NBA, but with Boston. So really effective on the defensive end of the floor, especially with deflections, because deflections lead to steals. The Thunder have 16.2 deflections per game, which is the second most in the NBA. And then if you take a look at the coaching matchup between Mark Dagnall and Willie Green, where this is really interesting is I did take a look at coaches' records, head coaching records this season in one possession games. On the Pelican side, the entire season seemed a little off. But on the Thunder side, the way that Mark Dagnall has coached this team through the trials and tribulations that they have gone through In terms of, you know, they get a defense thrown on them that they haven't seen in a while or at all. And they try to make an adjustment in game so that they can eventually win the game, such as that double overtime win in Toronto. This is where coaching really comes into play when it matters, when you only have one chance, when you when you have such a tight game that can make or break your series. Mark Dagnall is six and three. In one possession games this season, that ties the fifth best in the NBA among 33 head coaches this year. Willie Green, on the other hand, is one and seven in one possession games this season, which ties the second worst record in the NBA this year. It's it's not a big indictment on Willie Green that the that the Pelicans haven't been able to produce in those moments. However, it is it is important to keep in mind that that can be used against him if it's if it leads to four straight losses. Well, it's not going to be all the time where like, oh, the Pelicans lose four games and all of them are one possession games. But if the series stays close game after game after game, 
and the Pelicans find themselves in this situation where the Thunder are always beating them in one possession games, then it's going to matter. That's why I bring these stats up. Now, the Thunder are not perfect. They have some weaknesses, which I've mentioned in the past, mainly their rebounding and their second chance points. Let's start with their rebounding. They are 28 and 22 this season when out rebounded. Doesn't sound like an issue. When you compare it to the rest of the league, it really isn't. They have a 56% win percentage, which is second in the NBA behind Boston. That's the most wins in the NBA with 28 wins. The next most was Dallas with 22. Remember, they had a 22 and 23 record when out rebounded. So really, it's not a matter of when the Thunder get out rebounded, although you want to out rebound your opponents more than the other way. But it's the frequency. They've played 50 games when out-rebounded. That's a lot. That's more than half your season. You don't want to have that many games where you need to rely on your rebounding and you just can't get there. Again, your efficiency matters. The Thunder are one of the most efficient teams on the floor, and so really offensive rebounding is not as much of an issue for them because there aren't as many opportunities. So raw numbers are not enough to really dictate how they will play when they don't have that rebounding available to them. If they miss a lot of shots, though, that's a different story. When they out-rebound their opponents, or even so much as match them, they're 29-3. and three. That's ridiculous. 29-3. and three. That's a 90.6 win percentage, which is the best in the NBA since Phoenix did it in 2021-2022. They won 60-plus games, but then lost to Dallas in seven games in a heartbreaking fashion for them, not for those of us in this market. But if the Thunder somehow can out-rebound the Pelicans, they will be in the driver's seat to really take this series and command it all the way through Maybe get it over with in five games. Let's take a look at their second chance points because I did I did bring up that it's important in totality of its context. They score only 11.8 second chance points per game this year. That's 27th in the NBA. 9.8% of their overall points come from second chance this season, which is the second lowest in the, in the NBA this season and the seventh lowest of any playoff team in NBA history. Again, they're designed to overcome that because of how well they shoot. But when they're not shooting well, and defenses are going to be able to stop the Thunder from time to time throughout the rest of the playoff run, how can the Thunder adjust when they can't make shots and when they can't rebound? Because that's not a good spot to be in. The other thing that's really important about this rebounding there or their lack thereof is probably more damning than them trying to offensively rebound their misses. They allow 15.3 second chance points per game this season. That's the third most in the NBA. So really the alarm bells are supposed to be rung for when the Thunder are on defense and they can't get a rebound. That is, that might kill them in the second round because of who they may play in the second round. Where, who that would be? That will come with my predictions in the next segment. That pretty much does it for how I see the Pelicans' strengths and weaknesses and the Thunder's strengths and weaknesses. So, the time has come. In the next segment, I'm going to predict how the first round is going to shake out. It may end up changing in a week, but these are my early predictions. Let's see how long I stick with them. Hopefully a long time. All right, that's coming in the next segment. We've made it. This is the moment of truth. Early playoff predictions coming right up but before that i want to tease the next episode will be an updated playoff outlook between the mavs and clippers and the pelicans and thunder hopefully there are no sweeps so that there is more time to break down how these teams play against each other and if everything were a sweep well we would have the finals in may and we don't want that all right first round bracket in the eastern conference the number one celtics and the number eight heat I have the Celtics winning in five. 
the Heat may take a game, the Celtics may give a game. I don't know how that would happen, but the Celtics are the best team on paper. And after last year's debacle, hopefully they've learned their lesson. Uh, there have been some times this year where it doesn't seem like they have, but that's why I give Miami a game. Celtics in five. Point blank. Number four, Cavaliers. Number five, Magic. This one was a difficult prediction to make because although the Cavaliers are better on paper, the way that they ended the season did not give me much confidence in picking one of the two. And whoever wins this series has to play the winner of Boston-Miami anyway. I wanted to see how game one really shook out, how the Cavaliers executed against Orlando, how Orlando did the same against them because Orlando is not a good shooting team. So it's a matter of does, can Cleveland live up to those expectations? And game one showed me they can. So Cavaliers in six on that one. The Bucks and the Pacers. I'm calling an upset here. Although I don't think anyone should be surprised. Giannis Antetokounmpo is not available. Number three Bucks are stuck with a dilemma. They play Giannis, they risk tearing his Achilles. And the last thing I need to see is another person tearing their Achilles because a team wanted to win now. It's just not worth it. I don't think he should be back the rest of the playoffs. It's not worth his long-term health, especially given that he's in his prime, and if you lose more than a year of his athletic prime to recovering from an injury, that, from a uh, career-altering injury, you may set yourself back in the near term as well as the long term. I have the Pacers winning this game in six, winning the series in six. Also, because they seem to have their number. They're, they're, the Pacers are the best offense in the NBA. Like they score the most points in the NBA. They're ridiculous. So for them, as long as Tyrese Halliburton is not as hampered as he has been with that hamstring injury, which I have lamented all the way back in February, the Pacers should upset the Bucks in six games. And I don't know how long Doc Rivers stays on. As head coach, I really don't know. He's, he's 0-4 in one possession games this year, which is the worst record in the NBA for a head coach among all 33 head coaches that have coached a game this year. And then the other hard series in the East, the number two Knicks and the number seven 76ers. Because for me, my initial pick was that the Knicks would win in seven. But it was heavily dependent on how well Joel Embiid responded from his knee injury. And he has not looked well in terms of laboring on that knee. He's pro he's produced. He's scoring. He's rebounding. He's assisting. He's doing what he does on a regular basis. It's just taking more of a toll on his body. And I don't know that he can lead the Sixers past the New York Knicks, led by Jalen Brunson, with Josh Hart and Dante DiVincenzo, and the way Miles McBride played in Game 1. Isaiah Hartenstein, uh, excuse me, Isaiah Hartenstein, at the rim, being that defensive anchor, Mitchell Robinson being more of a being more of a defensive anchor whenever he's called upon. Without Julius Randle, that New York Knicks team is still somewhat to behold, and they don't have to play Boston in the second round either. They would play the winner of the Bucks Pacers series. So the Knicks have a deep run in them. The Sixers are the main team standing in their way. But if Joel gets hurt, every single game like he did in game one. And if one of those injuries leads to him not being able to return, that completely changes the dynamic of this series. The Knicks might win in five. I just don't think Philly has what it takes to keep themselves in the series without Joel. They were one of the top three teams in the East until he got hurt. And then they free fall their way down to as low as eighth, eventually seventh. So, for me, right now, I have Knicks in seven because Joel is still playing. Unless he goes superhuman, I don't really give the Sixers a chance in this one. Let's move on to the Western Conference, starting with the Oklahoma City Thunder against the number eight New Orleans Pelicans. Had the number eight seed been the Lakers, this would have been a completely different bracket. But that was not the case. They won the first game in the play-in tournament. And their consolation prize was a date with the NBA champions, the Denver Nuggets. I'll break that series down last. But between the Thunder and Pelicans, 
especially without Zion Williamson on the floor, although the Pelicans do play well without him. I have the Thunder winning in six. They just don't make as many mistakes as the Pelicans do. They do The Pelicans do turn over the ball a little bit more than I'd like to see them do. They're not great in the clutch, the Pelicans. They have a horrible record in one possession games, the Pelicans do. The Thunder are just overall able to sustain whatever the Pelicans can throw at them. And their last game probably should have reflected that considering they went on what looked like, I, th- I believe it was a 12-0 run after the Pelicans finally took the lead. And that was with Zion on the floor. So I have the Thunder winning that series in six. The number four Clippers and the number five Mavericks. Shocker. I have the Mavericks winning this in seven. The reason I have them winning in seven is because I'm factoring in Kawhi playing in the series. If Kawhi can't play, the Mavs win in six. I'm saying that now. The Clippers have no chance of winning this series. That's my take. I don't believe James Harden will be as effective as he was in the regular season. Russell Westbrook will still be who he is on the defensive side of the ball. He will be a pest. He will bring the energy all game long. Paul George may go nuclear. But without Kawhi, the Clippers just don't have enough with the way that the Mavericks have been playing and with the fact that practically everyone is healthy on the Mavericks side. Derek Lively is coming back from that knee sprain, and so he will most likely be available throughout the entirety of this series. What are you going to do? As long as these teams stay where they are, if they're both fully healthy, Kawhi is the only one in the Clippers injury report, then I still have the Mavs winning in seven. This will be a fun series. This will be the best series in the West. The next series, the number three Timberwolves and the number six Suns. If you saw how Anthony Edwards played in that first game, I might be giving the Timberwolves less credit than I should. I have the Wolves winning in seven. The problem is they might be done with the, with the Suns in five based on how they beat down Phoenix. That top-rated defense all season long of the Minnesota Timberwolves, they're at full strength now. They have AE. They have Carl Anthony Towns. They have Rudy Gobert. The way Nikhil Alexander-Walker has been playing off the bench. And then you have Nas Reed. You have Jaden McDaniels. You got so many pieces. Mike Conley, the veteran. You got multiple pieces that Minnesota can lean on. They have a little bit of depth, which Phoenix does not have. They don't run that many players through their rotation. And although Frank Vogel is supposed to be one of the more defensive-minded coaches, they have no answer. They had no answer in game one. Because although Minnesota has one of the best defenses, their offense can still go when it needs to. And Anthony Edwards has been the reason why. Carl Anthony Towns has kind of let Edwards progress to the point where he's the one taking the charge offensively for this team. So I have Minnesota winning in seven for now. That might go down to five. And then the last series, the number two Nuggets and the number seven Lakers. Yes, again, the Lakers, um, I they needed to have played the Thunder if they wanted to win a series. Because they play the Nuggets, I feel gracious in giving the Lakers even one game. But I have the Nuggets in five. Who knows if the Lakers find a way to sustain their success against the Nuggets that they get in two quarters throughout the entirety of a game. I'm not even sure that that will happen. And they haven't beaten the Nuggets in recent memory to the point where they can fall back on some plan that will help them win a game. So, um, no, I don't give the Lakers a chance in this series. I have the Nuggets winning in five. That might be a sweep. That might be the only sweep we see in the first round. Now, the NBA Finals prediction, I am jumping all the way to the end of this bracket. I have the Celtics playing the Nuggets, Boston and Denver, with the Celtics winning in seven, although Denver has beaten them, especially on their home floor. Really, as that series takes shape, if it becomes those two, the execution of how Boston, you know, figures out how they move their pieces around, how they get past everything that Denver is going to throw at them. 
can they really for Boston, it's a matter of, can they blow out the nuggets, which is hard to do because when they're in the clutch and when they, when it starts getting tight, Boston seems to have a little bit of a problem. They don't execute as well. When they get ISO heavy, nothing moves. Who would have thought? But on paper, it should be Boston in seven. In reality, we'll have to wait and see. It might not even be these two. Who knows if we get a shocker from this point to the end of the postseason. All right, that's it. That's all my predictions. I've got nothing left. Okay, thank you guys for watching and listening to this episode. We've made it. This is near the end. I'm going to be doing this through the NBA Finals. We're going to have a lot of fun. All right, welcome to the playoffs. That does it for me. This has been The Control Room. I'm your host, Esrael Johannes, signing off.